As we begin tonight, I want to remind you of the premillennial view of the book of Revelation. And then I'm going to contrast that with what the book of Revelation actually teaches. Now, this is a chart from the premillennial perspective. I'm not suggesting that this chart is accurate, but it is an accurate description of what premillennialists generally believe and teach. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The church is allegedly in the premillennial scheme of things, plan B. It was never God's original intention to build a church, to establish a church, we're told. They would even claim how Lindsay says very directly, and many others repeat his error, that the Old Testament has nothing to say about the coming church, that it was all something that uh, was uh, plan B, an emergency stopgap measure invented by the Father and the Son when Jesus was allegedly unexpectedly rejected by the Jews and they had to come up with something and so the church age and they claim that because the book of Revelation begins with Revelation chapters 1, 2 and 3 in particular in directing letters to the seven churches of Asia they claim this is John's way of saying well this is the church age but they believe that beginning at Revelation chapter 4 and going through Revelation chapter 19, they believe that everything you read from Revelation 4 to Revelation 19 is the same as what they think is going to happen during some supposed seven years of great tribulation on the earth. Now, where are the righteous going to be when this great tribulation occurs on the earth? The prime view of the premillennialist is that they will have all been raptured out of the earth's atmosphere uh, prior to the beginning of this seven-year tribulation. There are some premillennialists who believe that uh, they're raptured out in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. And there are some, these are very rare to find nowadays, who believe that they are taken out at the end of the seven years of great tribulation. The primary view is they're raptured out before the seven years of great tribulation begin on the earth. And who is running the show during the seven years of great tribulation? Allegedly, it's the Antichrist. And they would claim that the beast of the book of Revelation is equivalent to the Antichrist. And we'll show you tomorrow night and Wednesday that the Antichrist of premillennialism is not even recognizable when you read what the New Testament says about antichrists in the plural, and there is no one singular figure that is ever set forth in the New Testament as being the antichrist, as if there are no others. This is a figment of man's interpretive imagination when it comes to the Word of God. Now, they want you to believe that the 70th week mentioned in Daniel chapter 9 is equivalent to the seven years of great tribulation. They actually claim that after the 69 weeks of Daniel chapter 9 had gone by, God called a time out. He stopped the prophetic clock from ticking any further, and it won't tick again until the seven years of tribulation, and that's the time at which God will wind that clock again and allow the 70th week of Daniel 9 to uh, be uh, again and to come to an end. And what happens then? They say Christ is coming back. First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13, they would claim he's coming with his saints, meaning those who've been raptured. Of course, that term is often used to refer to angels, and Christ is coming with his angels. He's not coming with raptured saints who have been living with him for seven years. That's not what the Bible's teaching there in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13, but they claim it is. And so they say, when he comes back with his saints, first he came for his saints to get them, to take them, to live with him in heaven. And now he's coming back with his saints to fight the battle of Armageddon, to defeat the Antichrist, and to begin the seven, excuse me, the 1,000 year reign 
of the Messiah's earthly kingdom, during which time Satan will be bound, and there will be a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth, we're told, and Satan at the end of this time, and this always amazes me, even after Christ has been reigning for a thousand years on the earth, the premillennialists, because they insist that everything must be interpreted literally from the scriptures, they actually have to admit that even though Christ has been reigning for a thousand years, there's a second revolt. There's a revolt that takes place of Gog and Magog, and Satan is behind this uh, revolt and those who serve him. And then there comes the final judgment at which time men and women are given either a heavenly reward or a punishment in hell forevermore. And so this is the premillennial view of things. Now what does the book of Revelation have to do with this? Well, I'm going to be very big picture oriented tonight. If you if you came here tonight thinking, well, he's going to explain every single symbol in the book of Revelation to everyone's satisfaction, then you've come to the wrong place tonight. Uh, I'm not going to have the time to go through every symbol, even if I did understand every single symbol as it is given. I believe we can get the gist of every single symbol in the book of Revelation, but I would not stand and presume that I would uh, have the same exact knowledge and depth of understanding of those symbols as did the first century readers. It was Brother W.B. West who came up with a wonderful idea of trying to read through the book of Revelation with, as he put it, first century glasses. I'm not suggesting he's the only one that ever suggested that, but he certainly is the one that I heard popularize it. The idea of reading the book of Revelation through first century glasses. And so with that in mind, I want to ask you to imagine something. Imagine that you're living during the time at which the book of Revelation was written, and you're one of the churches that receives this letter. And remember this, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it was given to John... And notice, if you will, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 1, the Bible says this, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to, why was this revelation given? To show unto his servants, and are you ready for this part? Things which must shortly come to pass. And if you think this is only a, an emphasis at the beginning of the book, it is more than that. If you look at verse 1, you'll see that it's things which must shortly come to pass. Verse 3 of Revelation 1 says, the time is at hand. Now fast forward to the end of the book. Like bookends, the writer wants us to know that the things in this book were about things that were relative to things in that day and time which were to shortly come to pass. And you'll notice in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 6, the Bible says these sayings are faithful and true. And this is what John was told by the one revealing this to him. These things are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And then verse 10, He said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. It's right at the door. It's near. And so imagine that you're a first century recipient of this. You're a member of one of those seven churches of Asia. And you say, well, what do you mean when you say that? Go back to Revelation chapter 1. And notice something here in this passage of Scripture. This was a book that was sent and signified. It might be helpful for us on this occasion to pronounce this word, signified. Because this book was written in signs and symbols and then given to the churches who would have it read in their hearing. And notice, if you will, please, in Revelation chapter 1, in verse number four, that this book is not only a record about what John saw, but it's about what he wrote and he addressed it 
to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then if you'll stay in the chapter and notice Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, you have Jesus saying, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He says, John, what you see, I want you to write it in a book. And then what? Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then if you were to look at this on the map, by the way, you would see that these were given in a fashion where the letter could go from one church and then to the next and to the next and the next. On the map, it's written in this way. Take it to Ephesus, then where? To Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now, if you're a member of one of those churches, what was your life like during that day and time? What were you experiencing during that day and time? If you were a first century reader, what would your life have been like? And uh, let me ask you this, as you're excited to hear, did you hear, did you hear, did you hear? Did, did we hear what? John has sent a letter it's a revelation of Jesus Christ that Jesus showed to John. And John has written it down and signified it, signified it. And that letter is going to be read in our assembly today. And we're going to hear what Jesus revealed through John. Now, would the first century hearers, if you had been there in the first century, and this book had been read in your church assembly that you attended that day, would you have been sitting there thinking, you know what? I bet this is about events and places that are 20 centuries removed from us. I actually had a dear relative tell me with a straight face that he found it fascinating that the book of Revelation predicted helicopters in the Vietnam War. Now may I ask lovingly, if you are someone going through what John described as tribulation, you say, oh, tribulation, that's in the future. No, my friends, there was great trouble and trial and difficulty and suffering going on in the first century. We don't have to wait for it to come. It already came. And John said he was a companion in tribulation with the brethren in these churches. They were suffering. In fact, look at Revelation chapter uh, 1 and verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation. And then look at chapter 6. In Revelation chapter 6, beginning at verse 9, how, how much suffering are we talking about? Well, this is serious. He says, when I passed, when he'd opened the fifth seal, that is, I saw under the altar, altars were used for sacrificing things. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? I can promise you that there were people being martyred in the first century and in the churches of Asia. In fact, go to Revelation chapter 2. I want to show you what was stated to the church there at Pergamos. In Revelation chapter 2, in verse number 13, Jesus tells them through John's pen, I know your works. He said, I know exactly where you, dw where you dwell, where Satan's seat is. And he commended them for holding fast his name. He says, you haven't denied the faith or my faith. And then watch this. Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Did those people in that day and time know anything about trouble and trial and tribulation and sorrow and pain and suffering? Yes. Yes. So tell me how these people hearing this message of helicopters in the Vietnam War would have been comforted by such a revelation. Oh, there are going to be helicopters in the Vietnam War? That makes me feel a whole lot better about being beaten for my faith. That makes no sense whatsoever. 
And yet Mr. Hagee and others like him can get on television with their well-drawn charts behind them and dupe and deceive a lot of people into believing that when John wrote the book of Revelation, he was thinking about events 20 centuries in the future. Now, don't get me wrong. God is capable of predicting events centuries in the future. But that's not to say that every time he wrote something that it has a futuristic application to it. There were things that were written about those events that must shortly come to pass in their day and time. And the book of Revelation is a picture of spiritual warfare with God and Satan as his principal opponents involved in the warfare. Now let me make some general observations here. Some would say that the book of Revelation should be dated prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and that uh, its predictions have to do with that. Now there are others who would suggest no, the, the book should really be dated around AD 96 or in the 90s, somewhere in there, and that the thrust of the book has to do with Rome and the Roman emperor and the persecution that he was heaping upon God's people. And I suppose we could spend a lot of time debating the pros and cons of each position concerning whether the date is AD 70 or whether the date is uh, AD 96 or somewhere in between that. Uh, we could probably spend, uh, uh, an, I know we could more than probably spend time looking at each nuance of each symbol in the book and what its precise meaning is. But our time will better be spent tonight focusing on the main theme in the book, and that is victory in Jesus. And we're going to give the big picture and try to interpret some of the symbols along the way, at least specifically enough to give you a flavor for how the book unfolds. Now, it really doesn't matter in the final scheme of things whether you take the position that this is about the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of those Jewish authorities that were persecuting the, the church, or whether you think it's about the fall of the Roman Empire and the emperors who were persecuting the Christians, and the principles certainly apply, whether it's the Jewish authorities of the Roman Empire or any other world government from the past, present, or future, the bottom line of all of this is we win. Christians win the victory no matter who you think the opposition is in the book. The comfort can be found in knowing this truth. The world doesn't win, Christians do. Satan doesn't win, Christians do. But what I want to do is look with you at what the specifics are in the book about the opposition. The chief opponent of the book of Revelation is the one called the enemy in Matthew 13, 39, and that is Satan himself. In Revelation chapter 12, I want you to notice the language that is found there in Revelation 12 in describing the chief opponent that we face. Revelation chapter 12, you'll notice in verse number 9, the great dragon was cast out. And I love it when the book of Revelation will not only give you a symbol but follow up immediately with an interpretation. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Well, you say, well, who's the dragon? Called the devil. And Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth. His angels were cast out with him. And so I don't have to wonder about who the dragon is in this passage. It's Satan. The text comes right out and tells me that. And I learned some things about the nature of this dragon, this serpent, this Satan, this devil. I learned that he likes to fight. Uh, his name means adversary. The very word Satan connotes the idea of being an adversary, an opponent. He is a deceiver according to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. He deceives the whole world. And the Bible also tells us that he loves to accuse and he is the accuser of those our brethren, he says in chapter 12 and verse 10. The accuser of our brethren, though, will be cast down, is cast down. He accused them before our God day and night. And uh, we also know this about him. He seeks to destroy God's people. Revelation 12, 13. 
When the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And in verse 17, notice how far this goes. The dragon is wroth. He is absolutely enraged with the woman. You say, well, who are we talking about here? But watch this. This is where you and I fall into this a category of understanding because he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who are those people which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ? Now go back to chapter 6, if you will, and remember why are these souls under the altar? Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. The souls of them were slain, why? For the word of God, and here it is, for the testimony which they held. They would not back down from confessing and professing Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and they would not back down from worshiping him and him only, worshiping God and God only. The Roman emperor demanded worship. They weren't about to give it. Even if you take the position that this is about uh, items leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, uh, the Jewish high priest was certainly, after Jesus became our high priest, the Jewish high priest was arrogantly claiming for himself a position that was not rightfully his. So whether you're the Roman emperor in this text or whether you're saying you're the Jewish high priest in the text, both of them were in opposition to Almighty God as ruling officials that should not have been in the positions where they were. But Satan has his ministers, does he not? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15 describe these ministers, and they appear to be something they're not. And upon further review, they are indeed deadly. Now, I want you to see Revelation 13 with me. In Revelation chapter 13, we start getting some discussion of the beast. And in Revelation 13, here's what we have. John says, I stood upon the sand, verse 1, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And he said, this beast had seven heads and ten horns. And upon those horns, there were ten different crowns. And upon his heads, the, the name of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, he said, it was like a leopard, had great speed. His feet were as the feet of a bear. The mouth was as the mouth of a lion. The, the dragon... We already know who the dragon is. That's Satan. Satan empowered this beast to be able to do what he was able to do and uh, his seed and great authority. Now you say, well, is the Bible its own best interpreter? Thankfully it is. I want to take you back to the Old Testament book of Daniel because we get some real important help in Daniel chapter 7 for how to interpret this concept of the beast. What does beast mean as it's being used and you know, it's interesting, if you follow football at all, uh, there's a player right now that is running back in the NFL, and when he's having a particularly good game or has a particularly good play, he will talk about going into beast mode. He's in, even got t-shirts advertising this idea of beast mode. No one takes that to be literally, oh, you, you literally turn into a beast? It's as if. He is like a beast that can't be conquered or tackled, and that's the figurative language that's being used. And everyone understands how beast can be used in a figurative way uh, without meaning something literal. And so in Daniel chapter 7, notice Daniel sees something in this vision. And in verse 2 he says, I saw in my vision by night four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. Now remember, Revelation 13 depicts a beast coming up out of the sea. Daniel, did you see any beasts coming up out of the sea? Watch. Verse 3. And four great beasts came up from the sea. He says they were all different one from another. He said the first one looked like a lion. It was like a lion, but it had eagle's wings. So it had strength and speed. And I beheld till the wings were plucked. And then he goes on to describe another beast in verse 5 that he says it was like a bear. And then he describes a leopard, verse 6. And then he continues to go on and describes the fourth beast in verse 7. Now here's where the Bible's its own best interpreter. Look at Daniel 7 and verse 17. 
these great beasts, which are four, are tell us, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. Question, does the inspired word of God ever use the term beast to refer to a world emperor or king or ruler? Yes or no? The ruler of an empire? Yes. In fact, it's used to describe different emperors and different empires. And so it's not surprising then to consider that the beast, the ruler of the nation that was persecuting God's people is empowered by the dragon, Satan. And you'll notice that according to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 7, this beast or ruler was indeed making war with the saints, attempting to overcome them. And uh, so this is the opponent. We see the chief opponent is Satan, and the other opponents are those who are doing his bidding. In this case, in Revelation, the ruler that is causing all the pain and the suffering to God's people. Now, how does the devil use certain obstacles to try to cause men to go astray and to leave God and to quit being faithful? Well, he uses a number of weapons of mass destruction of his own, spiritually speaking. And one of them that is very prominently mentioned in the book of Revelation is that the devil uses the weapon of false doctrine to try to damn the souls of those who follow Christ. I know this is true because in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2, the church at Ephesus is commended for trying those who say they are apostles and are not. He says, I'll give you credit. You found them to be liars. And in verse number six, he says, I give you credit for hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He said, I also hate their deeds. Now the church at Ephesus had the problem of leaving their first love, but they are given credit for fighting false doctrine. Pergamos, do you have any uh, commitment to stopping false teachers? Look at Revelation 2.14. He said, I have a few things against thee. There are some good things, but he says, I've got some things I'm not, I'm not happy with. He says, you're tolerating some there that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And uh, he says in verse 15, you also have some that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans which thing I hate. Now, we don't have the time tonight to explore what the likely doctrine of these two groups was, but the bottom line I'm trying to get across is this. There was false teaching circulating that threatened the well-being, spiritual well-being of God's people, and the church of Pergamos is told you need to quit tolerating that in your midst. What about Thyatira? Watch verse 20 of Revelation 2. He says, I have some things against you, a few things against thee. You tolerate or suffer, you allow that woman Jezebel, not literal Jezebel of the Old Testament, but someone that was like her in action and attitude. She calls herself a prophetess. She's teaching and seducing my servants to commit fornication, to cast things, to eat things that is sacrificed to idols. He said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She didn't repent. So I'm going to cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Now, don't think, oh, every time I see the word great tribulation, I have to think way off in the distant future when that seven-year period finally begins. Because here's a news flash for some in the religious world. There is no future seven years period of great tribulation that's going to stand out as seven years of great tribulation as opposed to tribulation we could read about in the destruction of Jerusalem as we talked about last night in Matthew 24 where 1,100,000 bodies were found in Jerusalem after the Roman armies invaded and killed and slaughtered. And you think about... Uh, uh, all those individuals that were persecuted in the first century and who were already being put to death for their faith like Antipas was. That was trouble and trial for them, I guarantee you. They didn't think we needed to wait for some future. And so here's what was going on. Thyatira was tolerating Jezebel and they were condemned for so doing. Now, it's interesting. False teachers never change in one sense. 
they want you to think they're innocent and uh, harmless. In Revelation 13, 11 and following, he describes those false teachers who were doing the bidding of the beast and the bidding of Satan. He had two horns like a lamb. Oh, he looked like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. Looks so harmless, but he's not. He is like a wolf in sheep's clothing, and you don't need to give in to the teaching that he's doing because it's erroneous. And so the devil uses false doctrine to try to damn souls. He also uses suffering and persecution to try to discourage saints into giving up on God. And the message of the book of Revelation is don't give up. There is a reward awaiting you. Souls under the altar are not going to be under the altar. They're going to be exalted to thrones and places of victory as we'll see at the conclusion of this message in just a few moments. But in Revelation chapter one and verse nine, we've already seen that John said he was a companion in tribulation. But look at this and imagine you're one of the members of the church at Smyrna and the letter has finally come to your congregation and here's what it promises you. Revelation chapter two, verse nine, I know thy works and what? And tribulation. You mean folks were experiencing tribulation in the book of Revelation in that day and time? Yes. We don't need to look for it in the future as if it's never happened before. He says, I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. They're really the synagogue of Satan. Watch verse 10. He tells those members of the church at Smyrna, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. You're already experiencing things, but it's going to, you're going to experience some trouble in the future. In fact, he says, the devil shall cast some of you, some of you at Smyrna, read this through first century glasses and imagine what you would be feeling if this was read to you. Some of you are going to be cast into prison that you may be tried and ye shall have tribulation 10 days. And what he means by that is for a short period of time compared to the rewards that will be given to you if you experience and get through this tribulation, you're going to be persecuted for a short time but rewarded for a long time, for forever. In fact, he says, he says, you just be faithful even to the point of being willing to die for your faith in Jesus Christ. Be willing to be sacrificed on the altar of those who profess Jesus Christ. And I will give thee a crown of life. Your death won't be the end, but a means to an end. And so he's telling them, don't give up. There is hope beyond this life. And in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 13, he mentions that some who hold fast to his name and haven't denied his faith are going to indeed be like Antipas, a faithful martyr. And we know what happened when Stephen was martyred. He was able to see the Lord at the right hand of the Father on high and know there was hope for him beyond this life. And that's what the early Christians in the seven churches of Asia needed to know. And we saw them under the altar there in Revelation 6, 9 to 11 a while ago. We see them crying out, how long are you going to let the people that put us under this altar, that persecuted us and shed our blood, are you going to let them get by with this? And the message of the book of Revelation is they're not getting by with anything. You are going to survive this. As a matter of fact, you're going to be amply rewarded. Look at Revelation chapter 13 for just a moment and note this. In Revelation 13, he mentions that the beast in this passage, the ruling official and those under his direction were going to be making war with the saints, verse seven, to try to overcome them. But I want you to go back to Revelation three and verse five and watch something. Jesus said, if you overcome, you may come over and live with me. This is what brother Johnny Ramsey used to say often in his lectures on the book of Revelation. And I've listened to a lot of great teachers on this book over the years and have tried to assimilate that into my own understanding and whatever's been simple and easy to understand, I've tried to repeat because this is the simplicity of the book. If you overcome Revelation 3, 5, 
You'll be clothed in white raiment. I won't blot your name out of the book of life. I'll confess your name, he says, before my father and before his angels. There is victory in Jesus. And no matter what the beast and his henchmen may do to you, you win in the end. You will experience the victory. You remember that Jesus said, fear not those who kill the body, but after that have no more they can do to you. But rather fear him that is able to kill both body and soul in hell, Matthew 10, 28. This is echoed in the book of Revelation over and again. And you notice there was indeed a lot of bloodshed going on. Revelation 17 and verse 6. The woman is depicted here as being drunken with what? Not with intoxicating liquor. What's she been drinking a whole bunch of? She's drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And what's going to come next? Does she win? Look at the outcome. Satan prevailed not. I want you to go back to Revelation 12 because this is the story of Satan's life, by the way, when it comes to trying to fight against God and God's people. In Revelation chapter 12, notice that a statement that is made in verse number 8, after talking about in verse 7, the dragon fighting. Verse 8, and prevailed not. And so the dragon, Satan, never wins. He tries to conquer Job. He prevailed not. He tried to conquer Christ by tempting him on more than one occasion, according to Luke's account. And Jesus never gave in. And I love Revelation 14 because you talk about a message of hope. Look at this. Revelation 14, verse number 7. Our verse 6 mentions the everlasting gospel. What is, you see, the Roman emperors came and went. The Jewish authorities came and went. There is someone who occupies the throne, and it's his, and no one can dethrone him, and that is Jesus Christ. And those who serve him will be surrounding him and also be elevated, as it were, to thrones of sorts so that they could also enjoy this victory in Jesus. Watch Revelation 14, 7. There's this gospel preach that says with a loud voice, Fear God, give glory to him. And then you'll notice in verse number uh, 11, the smoke of the torment of those who had uh, done these things to God's people would ascend up forever and ever, and they'd have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast in his image, those who receive the mark of his name, would never be rewarded. And someone says, well, what is this mark of the beast thing? Look, I, I know that there are some folks who would consider what I'm about to say an oversimplification, but for the sake of the time and effort that we have available to us left tonight, I'm going to just describe this in this way. Do you remember ever going to a theme park where they will stamp your hand with some invisible image that doesn't show up unless you hold it under a certain ultraviolet light or certain scanner that will then illuminate the image and show them, yes, you are authorized to enter this park. They do this at the beginning of the day so that if you need to go out to your car in the middle of the day to eat lunch or to grab some item, you don't have to repay to enter. You are authorized personnel. And they may want to see your mark, your image on your hand that would thus show that you are one of the authorized ones to enter in. But we don't view that as some kind of end time sort of sinister thing that is going to be, oh no, did you, they put a mark on my hand. This, that must be the Antichrist. No one thinks that. We understand the purpose of the mark. It's to show authorization. In the first century, especially as it relates to the Roman Empire, those who would buy and sell in the marketplace needed a marker certificate to indicate that they had pledged allegiance and loyalty to the Roman emperor as God himself. And the Roman emperors claimed the prerogative of deity. Some of them did. Domitian certainly did. 
and there were others who would make this claim of being deity. And you know, the Romans didn't consider uh, Christians worthy of persecution just because they worship God, but because they refuse to worship any other. And so imagine that you have been one who said, I will not, I will not allow any mark to be placed upon me that would suggest to people that I believe the Roman emperor is God. Well, if you don't have that mark, you've lost your authority to buy and sell in the marketplace. And if you don't have that mark, you might be persecuted for not having such a mark because we expect everyone in the Roman Empire to show proper respect to the Roman emperor. And so you might uh, be very well threatened because of this. But here's the good news. If you serve Jesus Christ, you win. You win. In Revelation chapter 16, let me just isolate a few of these wonderful statements that stand out in the book of Revelation that show the victory that is had. In Revelation chapter 16, the Bible mentions, indeed, a great day, a battle, verse 14, of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief, Jesus says, blessed is he that watcheth, verse 15, and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. In the Old Testament, there was a city called Megiddo. And there were decisive battles fought there. And this again should not be all that revolutionary and complex for us. If I say to you, someone met their Waterloo, do you get what I mean? Someone met their Waterloo, what does that mean? You remember Napoleon met his Waterloo and uh, he was defeated soundly and we've even started to refer to some battles as uh, reminiscent of victory or defeat depending on the battle that we're discussing. And so the idea of Megiddo, a very prominent battlefield in the Old Testament. And so what is the hill of Megiddo depicted as a place of a battle, figuratively speaking, between God and the forces of evil. And guess who wins every time? God always wins. When you were growing up, did you have a fella in your neighborhood, maybe you were that fella in your neighborhood, that when it came time to choose sides for the ball game about to be played, everyone wanted this guy on their team. Maybe you were the guy they wanted on their team. Maybe. You were like me, hoping you wouldn't be the last one picked, right? What was the purpose of choosing sides? You choose the folks you think give you the best chance for victory. And there were times in the neighborhood when if you had so-and-so on your team, you thought, we've got this. We can't lose with him on our side. He's too good. If that's true of a human being, imagine how true it is to the nth degree of a divine being, God Almighty, who can never be defeated, who will never be dethroned, and thus the picture is made. If God is on your side when the battle is about to be fought, guess who wins? You do. And in Revelation 19, Jesus is depicted figuratively as riding that white horse of victory. Revelation 19 and verse 11. And what does the Bible say? I want you to notice verse 10, by the way, that leads into this in Revelation 19. John says, I, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said, don't do that. You Remember, this is about worshiping God and God only. Angels weren't to be worshiped. Emperors weren't to be worshiped. John himself wasn't to be worshiped. No, don't worship anyone but God. This is the point of the book of Revelation. And uh, there is a reward for worshiping God alone. There is a consequence for worshiping anything in addition to God or anyone in addition to God. So uh, John says, look, I'm a fellow servant just like you. Worship God. Verse 11, I saw heaven opened. Behold, a white horse, him that sat upon him, faithful and true, in righteousness he does judge and make war. Eyes were like flame of fire, harkens back to Revelation 1 and the description, description of Jesus there. Note verse 11 or verse 13, I should say. 
He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, John would write in his gospel account. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who's that? It's Jesus. Who are we reading about here in Revelation 19 that comes with a, uh, a white garment, so to speak, and uh, his mouth has a sharp sword coming out with it. He smites the nations, rules them with a rod of iron. You read Psalm 2 and you see how nations tried to stop the anointed one from becoming the king of his kingdom. And yet he was anointed as king of his kingdom. And the end of Psalm 2 prophetically depicts him as ruling over the nations, not on earth as we will point out tomorrow night, there are passages which prove Jesus will never set foot on earth again, ever. If he did come to this earth, he couldn't be a priest and a ruler at the same time as Zechariah 6 and Hebrews 8 discuss. And we'll give more detail about that tomorrow night. But going back to the book of Revelation, what is he called in verse 16? He is called King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You mean he's above the ruling officials of our day? Yes. He's above the Jewish high priest? Yes. He's above the Roman emperor? Yes. He is capital K, all cap king of kings, all cap lord of lords. There's no one above him. And no one deserves the worship that he and the Father and the Spirit deserve as the Godhead. And so you'll notice that in Revelation chapter 19, there is indeed victory depicted. Now let me hasten on to uh, Revelation 15. Just a couple of quick phrases that stand out from Revelation 15. You'll notice that the wrath of God is depicted as being dispensed here over the beast. And uh, look at verse 2. There were those who had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. And they stand on the sea and they're depicted as having the harps of God to sing the song of Moses. Wait a minute, what was the song of Moses? We, through the power of God, saw the most powerful nation in the world, the most powerful ruler in the world, Pharaoh and his armies, defeated by God and God's people rescued from their bondage. That theme never stops. And you find it in the book of Exodus. You also find it in the book of Revelation. We win. God's people come out on top victorious. And God is the only one who deserves the glory and praise that comes to him. I love this simple statement in Revelation 17, 14. Some have suggested this is one of the key verses of the whole book. In Revelation 17, 14... Oh, these shall make war with the Lamb, yes, but the Lamb shall overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with Him, that would be His followers, they're called and chosen and faithful, and they are depicted as winning the victory. In fact, in Revelation chapter 18 and verse number 20, Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for watch, God has avenged you on her. They're crying out in chapter 6, is she getting by with this? Are you never going to avenge those who shed our blood? And God said, oh, I'm, I'm going to take care of her. I'm going to take care of her, and I'm taking care of you too, because those under the altar in Revelation chapter 6 are now where in Revelation chapter 20? As we begin to close out, notice here. In Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says in verse number 1 that John saw an angel come down from heaven with a key. What's a key do? It opens doors and locks doors. He's got a key to the bottomless pit. He's got a great chain in his head. What's a great chain do? It's, it binds and he lays hold on the dragon. Well, who's that? That old serpent. Who? The devil. And what happens to the devil? Satan. He's bound for a thousand years and he cast him into a bottomless pit. 
shut him up, set a seal upon him that he shouldn't deceive the nations anymore till the thousand years be finished. And then he's going to be released for a little season. We'll talk about that momentarily. Verse 4, I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived. Who did? They, they, the ones that had been slain because they wouldn't worship the beast. First century folks are being described here as having been elevated from under the altar to thrones. They are now where? Living, reigning with Christ during the time period from the time that they were martyred until the end of time. They are reigning with Christ at which time at the end of time, like everyone else, they'll receive a resurrection body and they will receive eternal reward or eternal punishment is the case for those who are not faithful. And so here in Revelation chapter 20, people have missed the point and have forgotten in modern times that the description here is of those who had been martyred for their faith in the first century. They're the ones being depicted as living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And if you look at the passages at the bottom of the screen, Revelation 2 and all of these, the idea consistently is we win, we win, we win. But I want to close with this. In Revelation chapter 7, there is some language here used that uh, we should really take time to notice. Revelation chapter 7, and notice verse 14 beginning. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14. You'll notice that uh, there are some depicted as being in white robes. In fact, in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, John says he beheld a great multitude Watch this for it, which no man could number. And what's this multitude consist of? All nations, kindreds, people, tongues stood before the throne. Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature, all nations, make disciples of all the nations. The Jewish club of the Old Testament tribes of Israel the 12 tribes of Israel was never where God intended things to stay. There were 12 apostles who revealed a new covenant. And if you want to be saved, you follow the teaching of the apostles' doctrine. And that adds you to this number of those who are saved. Revelation 7 is depicting the saved, those who've been cleansed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. And uh, the number, you'll notice he says in verse 13, one of the elders said, what are these which are arrayed in a white robes and whence came they? I said, well, sir, you know, thou knowest. He said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the lamb, and therefore they are. Right at the time John seen this, they're depicted as being before the throne of God. They're serving him day and night in the temple. And he that sits on the throne dwells among them. They don't hunger. They don't thirst anymore. They're not oppressed by the sunlight anymore. The lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall lead them and feed them. And the Bible says God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, I want to show you something quickly about the language of Scripture. And then I'll come back to this. Some people want to say every passage in the book of Revelation has to be interpreted literally, never any figurative language. I want you to see what happens when you force that on Revelation 14. When I was uh, in Etowah, Tennessee, one of our wayward members called me and she says, look, I know I haven't been to church, but there are some people coming to my door and wanting to study with me and they've got me so mixed up on the book of Revelation, I need someone to come and help me and I will come back to church too. And this has been a wake up call for me that I don't know my Bible like I should and I've been unfaithful to God and I need to come back. So I went 
and uh, some members of the Jehovah's Witness organization came, a husband and wife team as a matter of fact, and uh, they were getting ready to teach and I wanted to get on the plan of salvation, but they wanted to talk about the 144,000 and so I asked them, I said, by the way, I'm just curious, are you a part of the 144,000? Because little known fact to some, the Jehovah's Witnesses used to teach, they used to teach that only 144,000 people were going to be saved, period, end of story. But then in the 1930s, someone said, you know what, we've got a little problem here. Our worldwide membership is greater than 144,000. So apparently some of us aren't going to make it. What are we going to do about that? New revelation came to them allegedly in which they claimed the following. The 144,000 is the literal number, they claim, the literal number of the saved that will go to heaven, that's the heavenly class, but the rest of the saved will live forever in paradise on the earth. And that's what they teach, that the majority of the saved will live forever in paradise on earth. 144,000 will go and live in heaven, and they are the only ones, by the way, that are supposed to take the Lord's Supper annually. They only take it annually. And you're only supposed to take it if you're one of the 144,000. So I asked them, I said, are you one of the 144,000? And they said, oh yes, we are as a matter of fact. I said, how do you know that? Well, we prayed and God revealed it to us. I suspect there are more than 144,000 people in that movement who have prayed and claimed that God gave them this answer. But be that as it may, I said, well, can we look at this text then? Since you're part of the 144,000, I want to ask you something. In Revelation 14, John sees a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. I heard a voice from heaven and uh, verse 3 says, they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Do y'all have any children? Uh, yes, sir. Then there's no possible way you could be part of the 144,000. Because they are virgins. Guess what they said, and I knew they would. Well, that's figurative. He's saying they're morally pure, like a virgin. I said, I agree, it's figurative, and so is the number. So is the number. You can't just literalize the number and then figuratize what you want. And this, look, uh, you take my mom telling me, in, uh, in fact, let me just show you this from Scripture. This, uh, if you're going to literalize this, then only the beheaded could receive the promise of reigning with Christ for a thousand years because in Revelation 20 it says the souls of them that were beheaded are the ones who lived and reigned with Christ. If you're going to say everything has to be taken literally, then only the beheaded can be reigning with Christ for that thousand year period. But what about this thousand year time period? Uh, this passage right here is often mentioned by preachers for a good reason. When God says in Psalm 50 and verse 10, every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle upon the thousand hills. Who owns the cattle on the thousand and first hill? And the thousand and second one and the thousand and third one. What does God mean when he says, I own the cattle on a thousand hills? He means I own them all. They're, they're all mine. He's using the number thousand to refer to completeness. And then you see 1 Chronicles 16, 15. Be mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations. And so what about the thousand and first generation? Were they not obligated? Would they not be obligated to do what God commanded? What does he mean when he says the word he commanded to a thousand generations? The word which 
he commanded for all these generations. The thousand is comprehensive. It refers to the entirety of the group. And then Deuteronomy 7 and verse 9 mentions, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Are we to suggest that no blessing is given to those in the thousand and first generation Everyone knows how this term is being used, and guess what? It's being used in the very same way in this passage. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It refers to a complete cycle of time and victory. Their victory is complete and permanent. That's all that's meant by it. I'll prove to you tomorrow night that this cannot be anything that happens on the earth because as Brother Foy Wallace Jr. pointed out, and I'll simply note this chart tonight and refer to it in more detail tomorrow night. There are some things never mentioned in Revelation 20 that you would have to find there to make it match up with premillennialism. You don't find the second coming of Christ mentioned in verses 1 through 7. You don't find a bodily resurrection mentioned with reference to these souls that were martyred. In this passage, you find them elevated to thrones like the vision and valley of dry bones in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel, can these bones live? This represents the nation of Israel, which appears to be like a bunch of dead carcasses in a, in a desert place where they've been there so long the bones are bleached out. Can these bones live? Well, if you want them to, they can. Thou knowest. And all of a sudden, Ezekiel sees one bone connecting to the next bone. Flesh and muscles start coming. And these bones lived, and there was a resurrection of the cause. God's people that had been taken into captivity would be coming home in victory. Likewise, the book of Revelation teaches that those who died as martyrs for the cause of Christ would indeed know victory. And that, my friends, is where we close tonight with these words, these reminders. We know the outcome. We walk with the one who has the keys to Hades and death. That's Jesus. And we don't have any fear because we know the ending. I want to close with this illustration. It's a very easy to grab a hold of. I was an Indiana basketball fan in 1987. I was speaking to some young people a couple of hours away during the night of the national championship game. I asked my wife to tape the game for me and I was going to watch it when I got home. I didn't want to know any results. And so I tried to stay away from anyone that might spoil the, the outcome and tell me how it ended before I got to, ch to watch it with my own eyes. I don't know if you were a basketball fan or not, but that game was nip and tuck. It came down to the very end and uh, Indiana had fallen behind, but they, they're ahead. With about five seconds left, one of their guards by the name of Keith Smart drained a jumper, gave them the victory, and I was one happy camper. You know I still have that tape. And you know, every now and then, I still watch it. But I never have watched it the same way as I did the first time. The first time I was nervous about the outcome because I didn't know how it ended. I didn't know whether we would win or lose. And so my palms are sweaty and I'm getting worked up about it and nervous about it. And now even when I watch it now and I see they've fallen behind, it appears that they, they're going to be defeated. I, I don't sweat. I don't break a sweat at all. I know they win in the end. And friends, the good news for you and me tonight if we are in Christ, Revelation 14, 13, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. They have rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And so if you're here tonight and you're not in Christ, in the Lord, you need to get that way so that this victory, this sweet victory of this book can be yours. You must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I want you to read the book of Acts and find every one of those steps. And you'll see the cases of conversion constantly mention them. And all of the cases of conversion mention that they were baptized for the remission of sins or to enter Christ or to be saved or something that's equivalent to that. I want you to know you can be saved tonight. And no matter what else is going on, you can know there's victory in Jesus. It's yours. If you're wayward, you need to come back. 
Please do it now so that he can say to you, come over.